Good evening. Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, I am Susanne Schwenzer. I am a senior lecturer in the School of uh, Environment, Earth and Ecosystem Sciences, and I am an associate director of Astrobiology OU. And now I am coming to introduce Dr. Stanley Love. And I'll do it better than I did in 2014, because it's the se second visit 10 years ago. And in 2014, I stood here and I told the audience everything that I was so super excited about what he was doing at the time. And I completely forgot that he is actually an astronaut and was in space. So much for that. And we'll start differently this time. It was STS-122 to the International Space Station to install the European module, Columbus module, uh, onto the space station. That's right. So with that out of the way, there are many more cool things and some that I find even cooler because, uh, first of all, he is a planetary scientist and astronomer. He worked on meteorites. He is an astronomer, physicist, all of these things. And that's where we connect here. I know a colleague of mine, Vic Pearson, she has worked on similar things and cited him a lot and probably vice versa. So there are lots of connections to the research we are doing here. And uh, that means he got his, I should not forget that, he got his uh, PhD from University of Washington in Seattle. He then went to the California area and got his postdoc at Caltech and then went to JPL as an engineer, actually, and then became an astronaut in, help me, 2000 and I have it on 1998, my... longer ago than I like to admit. <laughs> there we yeah. go. I already talked about your space flight. I'm not forgetting that okay. again. Um, but what I was so excited about last time is uh, Stan is doing a lot of simulation work, going into places such as underwater habitats, Antarctica, the deserts, and driving around vehicles that are uh, being tried and tested for the moon and other places. And that's what I was going to be so excited about last time. But this time, I am much more excited about what's coming up, and that's Artemis and the moon. And that's what he is doing these days. You helped uh, design the uh, cockpit of the Orion space capsule, right. uh, dealing with the lunar gateway. But most importantly, probably the lead Capcom, and you explain what that is. Yeah, I'll talk about that. <laughs> the lead Capcom of the Artemis mission. So we'll hear all about that and I'll shut up and leave the stage okay. to you. Thank you, Susan. All right. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and thanks everybody for coming out. Um, so as Susanna said, I want to talk to you today about uh, some of the stuff that NASA is doing in the future. Um, but I'll start with our current point of reference. So this is the International Space Station in low Earth orbit, about 250 miles up. So if the Earth is a ball this big, that's how far out into space we are. It's really not very far. We're just barely above the top of the atmosphere. We've been operating the space station up there now for 25 years. Uh, I think we're just coming up on the 24th anniversary of having people living on that spacecraft permanently. There has never been a time in the last 24 years. Anybody in here under 24? There is, since you've been alive, there has always been at least one human being in space. So, but that's 25 years. That's been a long time and NASA is supposed to be looking forward to the future. And so we are getting ready to send people to the moon now for the first time since 1972. So I was six years old the last time any person went to the moon. I often get asked, have you been to the moon? I say, well, no, they weren't seven sending six-year-olds to the moon uh, during Apollo, but we're getting ready to send folks back there. So we're very, very excited about that. And um, that's what I'm here to talk to you tonight about. I hope that the speaking part of this will last about 45 minutes. So only about half of our time here and leave the other half uh, to, to tell you what you want to know about space exploration. Um, and in that regard, if you're thinking of questions, I can put on my astronomer hat and also answer questions about space science, planetary science, stars, black holes, things like that. Whereas most astronauts, when they hear questions like that, they ask where Stan is because they're engineers or physicians or something and they're, they don't have all the space knowledge. So uh, especially for this audience, we are going back to the moon with other countries this time. So remember the Apollo program was a, can be cynically thought of as sort of a Cold War stunt 
to prove that Yankee ro uh, rockets were better than Soviet rockets. Because back in the 1960s, it was clear to everyone that whoever had the best rockets was going to rule the world. And these decisions were made for geopolitical reasons, and it was America going it alone against Russia. Um, that's not the way we're doing it this time. We've gotten used to working with other countries on the International Space Station, and we're going to go with other countries to the moon. Our very first piloted flight to the moon, Artemis II, coming up in a little bit. I'll tell you about that. We, are, we have three Americans and a Canadian astronaut, and we will have Europeans and Japanese and so forth going with us when we go back to the surface of the moon. Uh, along with that is uh, an agreement called the Artemis Accords that NASA has been leading. And as you can see, very many countries have signed up, including that uh, little red, white, and blue flag there up above the United States flag there. Maybe familiar to some of you. Um, and since this slide was made, several other countries have also signed up. And it's basically a framework for how you operate in space. Um, uh, who's responsible for space hardware once it is no longer in use but still in space, whether you render aid to astronauts from other countries and things like that. So it's sort of a framework for common operations in space. And it was designed from the outset to be international. So I'm very happy to be able to say that it's not just going to be the United States, but we're, we're bringing as much of the Earth with us as we can uh, convince them to join. So the Artemis architecture, all the stuff that we need to go to the moon comes in three main parts. Uh, the first, and the first part of it that any of our flight hardware ever sees is the ground segment. Most of this is at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And this is a photograph of the refurbished crawler. So the uh, big tank treads there at the bottom. By the way, each of the little, the metal shoes on those treads weighs two tons. Um, and then sitting on top of the crawler is the launch platform, which is a large gray structure you see there. And then on top of that is the tower that uh, stabilizes the rocket and allows us to fuel up the rocket on the launch pad. So we build the rocket inside a very big building called the Vehicle Assembly Building, and I'll show you a picture of that later. And then we roll it out to the launch pad just like we did in Apollo. The launch platforms and the crawlers were actually both designed in the 60s for the Apollo program. They have been through a lot of refurbishment, um, but we can't afford to buy new ones. So we're doing the best we can with the hardware we've got. The second part of the of the triad here is the rocket. So this is the SLS rocket uh, sitting on the launch pa uh, pad at the platform. You can see they've rolled it up to the pad. Then they've driven the crawler away, leaving the platform and the tower. And this is the Artemis One stack down in Florida getting ready to fly in November of 2022. Um, so that rocket has more liftoff thrust than a Apollo Saturn V rocket. Two solid rocket motors uh, adapted from the space shuttle, but the space shuttle's uh, rocket motors were four segments tall. This one has an extra segment in for extra thrust. 8.8 .8 million pounds of liftoff thrust from the visitor's site. And you should go see one of these launches if you get a chance. From the visitor's site, a shuttle will vibrate the air in your chest like you're standing in front of the speakers at a big concert. This will flap your clothing against your body <laughs> just from the vibration from the launch as the rocket clears the pad. And that's from three miles away. Good fun. And then the third part, the part I care the most about, this is the Orion spacecraft. So the capsule shape came from Apollo. We know this can come back into the Earth's atmosphere from uh, lunar distance at just shy of 11 kilometers per second and survive entry. So we kept that shape. The service module behind it, which has the solar panels and the engines, comes from Europe. It's a European Space Agency service module. So we're already international with our spacecraft, and that can carry four people and support them for 21 days for a flight uh, to the moon and back. So ground segment, the rocket, the spacecraft that the people ride in, and that's our main architecture for getting ready to go back to the moon. So as I mentioned, Artemis One uh, launched in November of 2022, uh, stayed in space for just under a month, 26-day mission. And that one is in the bag. We got that one done. And I have some uh, pictures and imagery here. So this is a vastly sped up video of the rocket being put together. They stack up each of those solid rocket motors. Then they put the core stage with the four big main engines underneath it. Load up the stage adapter. And then here comes the upper stage, another stage adapter. and the Orion spacecraft with its service module. The service module is kind of hidden behind the big panel with the NASA meatball on it. 
and the Orion ship is underneath that shroud underneath the launch escape system. And that was what the whole stack looked like in the vehicle assembly building down in Florida. That building is 500 feet tall. And of course, for NASA, so we got a lot of logos. And now they're animated. And there's another picture of the rocket down at the pad. So for uh, since 2004, I have been one of the uh, astronauts who was sort of assigned to work on that Orion spacecraft. And from about 2010 to 2016, I was the astronaut assigned to work with the team building the SLS rocket. So when the time came for the first launch, I said, I am going to be at that launch, dang it. And I had to call down a bunch of favors and make people dislike me, but I really wanted to see that launch. Uh, so I got down there for the launch and I will show you a video shortly of what that looked like when we finally got there. It took us four tries. So I had a lot of trips to Florida. Um, and uh, I was not just hanging out on the beach and surfing while waiting for these. Uh, since I was down there, they wanted me to talk to a lot of news agencies and so forth. And many of our launch steps were in the middle of the night. So smile for the camera at two o'clock in the morning. I'll do my best. This is a sort of a diagram of what the Artemis One mission looked like. Um, and the whole purpose of this was to shake down the spacecraft with no people on board to make sure that it was going to work for the next flight, which would have people on board. And the most important thing that we tested on that spacecraft was the heat shield. So it's been a long time since we brought back anything big from the moon. And when you fall onto the atmosphere, having fallen all the way to the moon, you're going at quite a clip and you're going much faster than you do when you return from low Earth orbit, which we've gotten pretty good at with the space station up there and bringing all sorts of cargo and crews home. Uh, so we had a brand new heat shield that we really, really wanted to shake out. But the mission went something like this. We start sort of counting, following the numbers on the diagram, launch out of Florida, do one turn in low Earth orbit, make sure everything is working right. Then we burn the engines on that upper stage to kick us out of low Earth orbit and send us on a long, uh, sort of a long throw out to the distance of the moon. Uh, when that engine burn was done, you can see on sort of the gray dashed line there, the upper stage separated from Orion, and then it did a little tiny burn so that it would fly around the moon and then get kicked out by the moon's gravity into orbit around the sun and never come back and trouble us again. Although I'm sure, sure some astronomer someday will find it again. Have I found a new asteroid? It's made out of aluminum. Uh, we actually found one of the old Apollo upper stages that way, by the way. They found this thing on this really weird trajectory, and then they ran it backwards. Oh, it's an Apollo upper stage. Not really an asteroid. So after about six days of flying out to the moon, uh, the spacecraft flew by the moon at an altitude of only about 60 miles. So the moon is 250,000 miles away. We came just basically skimming the mountain tops of the moon. Um, and I was in mission control, uh, sitting at the Capcom console, you know, for training. I made no bad calls in the whole Artemis one flight because I made no calls whatsoever, no crew on board. Um, but I'm completely geeking out there because oh, there's South Pole Aiken base and you can actually see it. And there's, oh, there's a big ray crater on the backside of the moon. What is that? I had to look it up and that's Jackson. So the bright crater on the front of the moon with the like splash marks going out across the whole moon, that's Tycho. There's one just like it on the backside of the moon you never see, it's called Jackson. Um, and we went right over, down right over Mare Oriental, which is this gigantic impact bullseye where it hit the moon so hard that the solid rock splashed. You can see the rings of this enormous impact. So I'm geeking out and the flight director next to me, who's not a planetary scientist, said, what? South Pole Aiken? Trust me, we're, we're interested in South Pole Aiken. Okay, so we flew around the moon, burned our engines to kick us into an orbit that was now orbiting the moon but at a very great distance from the moon and going backwards. And the solid gray line on the right side of the chart shows that's one half turn in what we call a distant retrograde, distant retrograde orbit of the moon. So we did a half a turn there and we could have done one and a half or one half with the uh, consumables we had on board. We chose to do one half a turn because on our launch date, we wanted to come back and land in daylight so we could watch the heat shield and parachutes, make sure all that stuff, I keep hitting that microphone, it's not good. Here we go. So we did a half a turn in orbit so that uh, when we came back, we would land in daylight so we could get all the data we needed. Then burned engines to drop out of that orbit, another low swoop by the moon uh, to kick us back toward the Earth. And then we re-entered the atmosphere, came in over Antarctica, and we were getting camera video off of the cameras on the solar arrays as we were plunging down over Australia and underneath Antarctica. And I've been to Antarctica twice and I really like it. So I was geeking out there too. And the flight director's what? Um, 
then uh, re-entered the atmosphere and came in and landed in the ocean off of San Diego. Back during Apollo, we covered the oceans with the United States Navy so that no matter where they came down, we'd have a ship nearby, but now we can only afford one ship. So we, and that is only as far out from port as we can convince them to go. So we land pretty close to the US mainland off of, off of San Diego. So that's what Artemis One looked like from a diagram standpoint. And that was the launch when it finally went off at two o'clock in the morning. And that's uh, some pictures of the rocket arcing up. And there is a video. Now this camera is on the side of the rocket looking down as we light the engines. And you can see all the uh, water that we spray on the pad to keep the sound waves from the rocket from tearing apart the steel reinforced concrete launch pad. Elon Musk should have taken notes. Because when he tried it, he tore his launch pad apart. Um, and this is what it would have looked like if you were a, a fly on the side of the rocket as it pulls away from Florida. Okay. This is another view now looking down the side of the rocket for the moment when those solid rocket motors burned up all their propellant and separated off. So those things aren't making much thrust anymore, but they still look like a, a firework. And those plunge down into the ocean off of Florida and we don't recover them anymore. On shuttle, we used to pick those up and come back and refurbish them, refill them and use them again. This is a vastly sped up uh, video looking down the side of the stack back at the Earth as the Orion is leaving uh, the vicinity of the Earth, and we're putting the solar panels through their paces. So we have to fold the solar panels up away from the engines when we're doing a big engine burn, and we have to uh, make sure that they're in a safe place. Actually, when the crew is exercising, we have to get the solar rays in right just the right position because the crew is working this rowing machine, which happens to be the same frequency that the Solar arrays flap, and we don't want to flap them off the vehicle or we get in trouble. So just putting the spacecraft through its paces. Um, I have seen a lot of first flights of spacecraft, and Artemis One was the first where, about halfway through the mission, everything was going so well that the managers were knocking on doors in all the hallways. What else can we test? What else can we test? I've never seen this happen before. Usually it's, you know, what's going wrong? Why isn't it behaving the way we thought it would? Good thing we're doing a test flight. So this one, everything planned went so well that they were looking for new test objectives during the flight so that they could prove out the vehicle even more and make sure that we understood it even better before we were going to put crew on it on the next flight. Uh, and there's that brown patch there is Mari Oriental. And I don't recognize that landscape, but a lot of the moon looks kind of the same. And then we worked very hard to take a couple of good Earthrise pictures. That one's not one of the best ones because we were looking into the sun. Then that's an uh, artist's rendition of the spacecraft coming into the atmosphere because there was nobody up there to take that picture. <laughs> and then we splashed down right on target in the Pacific. Heat shield work, all the parachutes work. And then we picked it up with the one ship that we could afford, which is a big ship. Those big orange balloons, by the way, if the capsule lands in the water and tips over, that's super uncomfortable for, for the astronauts inside. So these bags inflate, and if any of them are underwater, it will upright the capsule so that we can uh, we can get the crew out. But we were practicing with that. Fortunately for us, you can see the, uh, the, the sea state is fairly benign, like dead flat calm. Uh, we landed upright, we didn't tip over, and we didn't need to use the bags but they are there in case we have more challenging conditions the next time. And then they brought the capsule back to the ship. This ship has a can be partially sunk and has a door in the back that they can bring things in inside um, or let things out, depending. Um, and we have a special mechanism in there to sort of uh, capture the capsule, hold it in place, then we can close the door, pump the water out, and. Um, bring our space capsule home and analyze it and see how well it did. And it did pretty well. All right. So that was Artemis 1. And that's in the bag. And uh, um, I was sitting at my Capcom console for training, even though there was no crew to talk about or talk to. Uh, but now we're getting ready for Artemis 2. We're expecting a 10-day flight. And that date is 2025 September. But don't buy your plane tickets to Florida quite yet. Um, all of our launch dates are subject to us learning new things. 
um, and they are still analyzing the heat shield from Artemis One. So it's possible that there may be more launch slips, but that's the day we're the date we're working to right now. And that works out pretty well for us because we think it's going to take that long with one training simulation a week to get all of our flight controllers, including our Capcoms, uh, trained up and ready for the flight. Um, if we tried to do it much sooner, we wouldn't have enough time to get everybody trained and ready. This is our brave crew. Reed Wiseman in the front. Um, on the right there, that's uh, Jeremy Hansen. He's our Canadian astronaut. Um, Ike. Uh, Victor Glover in the back. Uh, Ike is, is his call sign. I know everything. And he is very bright. Uh, Christina Cook, uh, before she was an astronaut, she was a winter over in Antarctica. And I admire anybody who could do that. I was down there for a couple of months. That was plenty for me. Um, uh, Reed in the front and Ike in the back are both uh, U.S. Navy test pilots. So they're like traditional astronauts. Jeremy is a Canadian Air Force pilot and Christina is a scientist. So they are our crew for the first crewed test flight of Artemis II. And if you remember the diagram from Artemis I, this one looks pretty simple. Well, that was the test flight. Why would we make it simpler? And the answer is because we have people on board this time. So uh, we're going to sort of take a crawl, walk, run approach for Artemis II. We're going to launch out of Florida. We're going to do one turn in low Earth orbit, make sure everything's working, like the engines and the life support and that the cabin holds atmosphere and stuff like that, because you don't want to get super far from the Earth if your cabin is leaking. So if that's good, we're going to burn our upper stage engine and to put us into a high orbit that's going to go up above our communication satellite belt and then come back down. It'll take about 28 hours to go far away from the Earth not nearly as far from the moon, about one-tenth of the way to the moon, actually, and then come back down uh, close to the Earth. And during that orbit, we're going to make sure the life support system works, in particular, the toilet. There's a lot of room for improvement in space toilets. Uh, if you take a look online at the uh, SpaceX's uh, Inspiration4 mission, um, the toilet didn't work too well, and the paying passengers were not happy. Um, uh, space toilets are in their infancy. By the way, every spacecraft has an electrical system. It has a navigation system, communication, power, all that other stuff. Every satellite has that. Only the ones with people on board have life support systems and toilets. So we don't have nearly as much flight experience with those things. So we're still working on it. So we're gonna make sure the toilet works. Uh, and if it's not, we're gonna come back down to the earth 28 hours later after people are <laughs> going to the bathroom in plastic bags, which is super unsatisfa unsatisfactory. Uh, and then we'll come back and re-enter and land out of that. But if everything's working, we will um, burn the upper state, or pardon me, burn the service module engines on Orion to then kick our orbit up high enough so that it will go around the moon. And what we've planned is you see the, the green S-curve heading out to the moon. That's what we call a free return trajectory. That is, once we've uh, burned our engines and sent ourselves out toward the moon, we'll pass behind the moon and the moon's gravity will bend us back toward Earth and then we'll come on the blue part of the S-curve and come back to Earth without having to fire our engines. And we're doing that on purpose, because if the engines don't work, you still get to come back. Once you've done deep space burns and put yourself into orbit around the moon, your life depends on those engines working. So we're going to test out the engines very thoroughly. And we will, um, but we're hedging our bet with a trajectory that gets us home, even if the engines don't work. So it's going to be about uh, one day in that high orbit, about four or five days out to the moon. Closest lunar approach. Everybody's very excited. Oh, we're going to fly around the backside of the moon. We'll get to see it in detail. And hardly any humans have ever seen that. Only the few Apollo astronauts have ever seen the backside of the moon. But <laughs> we're going to be 6,000 miles beyond the moon. So if you're thinking of seeing the mountains go whizzing by right underneath, you know, we're going to be kind of far away. Um, so we may not get a whole lot of good lunar science done there with our, our robotic cameras in low lunar orbit, like the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbit. Orbit are going to get much better views, but it's still going to be kind of cool. And we'll be out of communication with the Earth for a couple hours as we go, go behind the moon. So we'll uh, come back toward the Earth on the blue part of the S-curve, re-enter the atmosphere, and land off of San Diego, and then we have a big party. If you look carefully, there's a little orange segment. Uh, I think it's the number six there on the screen. We are, when we separate from that upper stage, after it's sent us onto this high orbit, we're going to do what we call a 
proximity operations demonstration or prox ops demo. And we're gonna fly around that upper stage, testing out the manual flying handling qualities of the Orion, because the next time we fly Orion, we're gonna have to dock with another spacecraft. And that is uh, fraught with peril. And so we wanna practice it as much as we can on this flight, even though there's no accommodations on that upper stage for us to actually dock with it. Okay, next up after Artemis II, it's gonna be Artemis III. Uh, it's gonna be almost a month long now, so it's gonna be a much lo longer flight. 2026 September, don't buy your tickets to Florida yet. Artemis II has to go off pretty well and everything else has to line up. And Artemis III is gonna take us back to the surface. And this is really complicated. So the first part's familiar. We're gonna launch out of Florida. We're gonna go into one turn in low Earth orbit. Uh, we're gonna fire upper stage engine, head out to the moon. But this time, when we arrive at the moon, uh, we're gonna do something like Artemis I, skim down low over the surface, fire our engines to put us into a strange long uh, elliptical orbit that goes over the moon's poles. And I'll talk about this more in detail later. Um, and there we will meet up with a lunar lander that was sent robotically by itself that is waiting for us. So we'll fly into that high orbit, rendezvous and dock with the lander. Two crew members will get out of Orion and into the lander. Two will stay on Orion in that elongated orbit. They'll separate. And then two crew members will fly that lander down to the lunar south pole um, for a landing and a couple of days of spacewalks and science, but mostly proving out the suits, but a little bit of geology down there. Uh, then they'll do the whole thing in reverse. They'll climb back into the lander. They will launch off of the moon. They'll meet the Orion in that long elliptical polar orbit. The two from the lander will go on to Orion. They'll separate. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen to the lander, but the eventual goal is to let us reuse those landers. So it might fly back from the moon to low Earth orbit, get tanked up again, uh, filled with propellant, and can land again on the moon. We didn't do this in Apollo. In Apollo, we had a two-stage lander. So it would land on the moon, burning all the propellant in the bottom part, and the astronauts would climb down, do their things, and they'd climb in the ascent stage, and then the Descent stage served as the launch pad for the ascent stage, and that got left behind. And the ascent stage would take the Apollo astronauts back up to their orbiting colleague in the uh, Apollo command module. And once everybody was on the same uh, spacecraft, they would they would ditch the ascent stage. It was in low lunar orbit, which is not stable. And so that would end up orbiting the moon for weeks or a month and then crash into the surface. And so none of that hardware was reused. Um, all of the ascent stages have left craters on the lunar surface, and all of the descent stages are still there at, at each of the landing sites. So we're going to try to reuse our lander this time. Once all the crew's back on Orion, they'll wait for that long orbit to take them low over the moon. They'll fire the Orion's engine, go back on the blue part of the S-curve, fall back toward the Earth, taking five or six days to get there, uh, re-enter the atmosphere, and land in the water off of San Diego. Whew. And that's just the orbital mechanics. This is where we are going. This is Shackleton Crater. Over on the left-hand side, you can see some pock marks in the, in the rim of that crater. That is the physical location of the lunar south pole. Um, this is going to be challenging for a bunch of reasons. The south pole of the Earth is hard. Um, the snowmobiles that we used in Antarctica in the summer when it was warm, even though they were designed by a Canadian company, and if anybody knows knows cold weather, it's Canada. The snowmobiles undercarriage, steel undercarriages would break at the welds because it was so cold. So metals behave badly when the temperature gets very cold. And that's the south pole of the earth. The bottom of that crater is so deep and the axial tilt of the moon is so shallow. That is the difference in where the sun is in the sky in summer and winter. It, it only goes up and down about a degree and a half. The bottom of that crater has not seen uh, a ray of daylight for four and a half billion years. The temperature in the bottom of that crater is about 230 degrees centigrade below zero, 40 degrees Kelvin for you scientists out there. You know, nitrogen is a solid. Well, we're not going to go down in that crater first day. We're, we'll land on the rim and, and sometimes it's lit at the rim and that'll be a little bit better. And someday we're going to go in that crater maybe with a nuclear powered rover, although I not sure that's a good idea because this is what that crater looks like in cross-section with the Grand Canyon to scale below. 
Okay, this is four times deeper than the Grand Canyon and about as steep and pitch black down there and 40 degrees Kelvin, so steel breaks at the welds. So maybe a little while before we get down there with like a nuclear powered rover with paint tracks or something like that. It's gonna be very challenging to work in that environment. But down in the bottom is where the treasure is. We think there is water ice down in there and some of these other craters near the lunar south pole where it's been picking up individual molecules from comet and asteroid impacts over the whole history of the moon. When a comet hits the moon, there's an enormous explosion. Comets are rich in water and those water molecules, they, they don't, they don't make like a plume like they do on the Earth. They bounce around the moon like Super Bowls. The moon basically has no atmosphere. So things, uh, air molecules don't collide with each other. They collide with the ground and then fly a couple hundred kilometers, bounce, 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 till they bounce accidentally into one of these cold traps and stick. And over four and a half billion years, we think there's millions of tons of water ice down in the bottoms of these craters. And water ice is like gold on the moon. Actually, it's worth 100 times more than gold on the moon. You can breathe it split it up into oxygen, hydrogen, breathe the oxygen, drink the water, the oxygen, hydrogen together make excellent rocket fuel. And if you don't have to ship that stuff from earth, it's worth $100,000 a pound on the surface of the moon. So that's where the treasure is. So that's why we're going to the South Pole. All right, this is a uh, computer rendering of the terrain around that Shackleton crater with some contour lines drawn there. So you can see what the uh, terrain looks like. And you can see that's very deep and very steep. And that's sort of a temperature map of some of how cold it is down in those craters. The bluer colors are colder. And a look at some of the other cold traps down there near the lunar south pole. And I love this video. So this is a, a computer generated simulation of the daylight near the lunar south pole. Now watch that central crater and you can see the bright spot on the crater rim moving around. One circuit of the bright spot around the crater rim is one month, one turn of the moon on its axis. So a lunar day, two week long illumination, two week night if you're on the equator, but very different at the poles, just like the poles of the earth where you have the midnight sun and the perpetual darkness in the winter. So this is a full year of lunar day cycles. You can see these enormous dark shadows sweeping across the landscape as the, these are the shadows of mountains near the pole. Um, and now if you're practicing to land there, and, you know, there may be some days when you can see where you're landing and then other days where you can't. So that's a challenge that we're going to face. Then if you plan on certain lighting conditions and your launch is delayed two weeks, then all those shadows have moved around 180 degrees and everything that's light is dark and everything was dark was light. And you're looking at a landscape that's unfamiliar to you uh, compared to the one that you've trained for. Also going to be a very big challenge. This is now getting into uh, northern hemisphere lunar summer, so there's hardly any illumination around the pole. The sun is north of the equator, um, and there's very little illumination on the south. And you can see there are uh, brief periods where nothing in this scene is illuminated at all. A very very interesting environment. So for that lander, uh, we have had three large aerospace companies in the United States uh, proposing to build the lander for us. And from them, at least for the first lander, we've selected SpaceX. They were furthest along. And that is what their lander looks like. And there's little tiny figures down at the bottom are people. This thing is like 100 feet tall. The Apollo landers were 15 feet tall. So this is enormous. And in fact, the people ride up at the top and there's going to be sort of an elevator that you ride down to the surface. And you really hope the elevator works for your ride back up, because otherwise you can't get back in your spaceship. Um, and I think in later iterations, they've made the landing legs a little broader on this, because you know the moon is not flat. And if you had a nice flat concrete landing pad to land on, that would work just great. But the, the moon is kind of lumpy. And um, there are actually pictures of, I think, Apollo 14 landed at like a 15 degree angle or something like that, it made it hard to sleep inside. But that's what our lander is going to look like. Uh, when Orion docks to it, it's going to look like a, you know, a pigeon on a steeple. It's very small compared to the giant lander, but the lander needs that to be that big to hold enough propellant to land on the moon and then take off from the moon, get into orbit, and then fly itself back to Earth orbit to, get, to be refueled. Uh, so the architecture to make that lander work is, is just being formulated now. Uh, we think we're going to launch one Starship lander-sized thing into orbit with a lot of insulation and a lot of fuel tanks. Then we're going to fly 8 or 10 or 12 
tankers up to that. They'll dock automatically, transfer all their propellant, go back and land. We'll fill that thing up. Then we will launch the actual lunar lander, which is the one on the far right, uh, up to that propellant depot. It will transfer all its propellant to that, and then the lander will go off and do its mission. Awful lot of automatic docking has to work right for that to happen. So we'll be looking for that. They're actually going to start proving that out the next flight of Starship, which I think is next month. Um, they're going to try to fly that to orbit and then transfer some propellant between tanks on that same vehicle without docking to another one. But that's just one step toward this architecture where we are able to fly 10 or a dozen tankers up to provide all the propellant. And that's sort of what this diagram is showing here. Although the four tankers there should probably be more like three times that many. Um, and then we also show uh, toward the center of the Artemis III uh, SLS rocket with the Orion spacecraft flying up to meet the lander. And then the lander goes down to the surface and returns. Here are some uh, pictures from SpaceX of their test flights of their super heavy booster, which is the big cylinder on the bottom, and then the Starship, which is the thing with the little stubby wings. That's the prototype for the lunar lander. Um, for ones that are going to re-enter the atmosphere on Earth, they want those aero surfaces so that they can steer the thing on its landing so that it comes back where it wants to. And then some of the uh, engineering mock-ups they've made. Uh, we are already we have been sending astronauts out to SpaceX many, many times to work with their engineers to try to understand uh, how to build this thing. It's going to have enormous internal volume. It's going to have a be very roomy and nice environment for the crews after they've been in Orion, which is pretty small. And we've also been figuring out how we're going to uh, land spacecraft on the moon. Uh, space shuttle landed like an airplane, and our commanders and pilots practiced for that in an airplane. But landing a rocket on its tail is not like landing an airplane on a runway where you can see what you're doing. You're, you know, where you're going is kind of down underneath your feet and it's hard to see. And the handling characteristics of a rocket on its tail are super different from an aircraft. So we have uh, rented time on a U.S. Air Force thing called the Kraken. So the crew is actually in that little capsule on the gimbal's in the center, and all this other uh, material around it is giving them the motion cues as if they were practicing to land on the moon. So we can type in whatever, uh, we can program this to behave like any kind of vehicle you could imagine. And this is sort of our training uh, test bed for getting people ready for the moon. Of course, once we get down onto the surface, we're not going to stay in the car. We're going to get outside and walk around a little bit. We're working hard on advanced spacesuits. Uh, we have two suppliers, Axiom on the left, Collins Aerospace on the right. And um, these aren't going to be like the spacesuits we use on Space Station, because in particular, they have to have hips that work. On the Space Station suit, your lower body is basically in a, in a tightly inflated balloon and you can't do anything with your legs. But for the surface of the moon, we need to be able to walk around and if we want to go any distance. So it's a whole new suit design. Um, you should see videos of the Apollo astronauts on the surface of the moon. Their suits didn't have hips and they would kind of do this, you know, kid, kid pony uh, lope to get from place to place. And you can do that, but it'd be better if you could actually walk. So we're working hard on that for both of those suits. And both of those suits will be tested on the International Space Station, not the hip part, but their function in, in microgravity and vacuum before we send them to the moon. All right, you thought Artemis III was complicated. We're going to make it even better. Artemis IV now, uh, looking at a year or two after Artemis III, that's when we're going to start building the gateway. So the International Space Station is right now supposed to be retired in 2028 or 2030. Uh, but everybody who has been involved in the station, Europe, Canada, United States, Japan, uh, even Russia, wants to continue working together. Although the Russians pulled out a gateway, they don't want to be—they don't want to work with us any, on any future things. So uh, we're going to build a little space station in orbit around the moon that will allow us to continue working internationally in space after the space station is gone, and that's called the Gateway. And Artemis IV is going to do the same. Fly out to lunar orbit, meet with a lander, go down to the surface, come back to the surface, get back in Orion and come home. But that Orion is going to have a new, much more powerful upper stage. So when we throw Orion to the moon, it's going to be carrying about a 10-ton space station chunk 
just like we used to build the International Space Station. And from those chunks with each flight, we're going to build up the gateway. Um, the first part of gateway is actually going to launch up there without people on board. And that's the uh, power and propulsion element and the first habitation module. So the first thing that Orion will take up to add to the gateway is going to be the European called, called IHAB, International Habitat Module. And we're going to build that gateway in that same elongated orbit there around the moon that I spoke about earlier. And I've got a few more words on it coming up. So hopefully in about 2028 September, we're going to launch Artemis IV. And that is a, a computer rendering of what we think the gateway might look like. And another picture of it with an Orion spacecraft with the, with the distinctive X-wing solar panels coming into dock. And this is sort of a diagram of all the parts of the gateway and their suppliers. And you see a lot of ESA and JAXA and NASA. Um, we expect to be able to get cargo ships up there, just like we have for the space station. Um, uh, J the Japanese Space Agency is going to supply some of those. They also, Japanese Space Agency also wants to build the uh, life support system for IHAB to gain some experience with that. Canada is providing a robot arm just as they did for the space shuttle and the space station. And then we have commercial companies that will also contract to, uh, to bring cargo. So the first element, power propulsion element, this is actually adapted from a satellite power system, big solar arrays, big electric thrusters. Uh, Maxar is building that for us. And you can see some of the boilerplate uh, early prototypes that they're working on for that power and propulsion element. That will attach to the HALO, which is the first habitation module. Uh, Northrop Grumman is building that for us. And you can see some of the first sections of that being produced here. The IHAB, uh, not quite as far as long, uh, uh, quite as far along. European Space Agency and JAXA are providing that. Your ESESA is providing the, the structure and the advanced life support is being provided by Japan. Uh, Europe is also providing a refueling module. One of the purposes of the gateway is when we have spacecraft meet in orbit around the moon, we want to be able to pump propellant from one to the other. So we want to be able to refuel things, send a tanker up there. And so that ability to pump propellant from one spacecraft to another is going to be, be accomplished by the Esprit module, also provided by ESA. Uh, it's also the only module that's going to have any windows to speak of it, so the crews will like that one the best. Uh, as I mentioned, Canadian Space Agency is getting ready to build a robotic arm to service things on the outside of the Gateway Space Station. Um, we're going to have an airlock for doing spacewalks on the Gateway. It'll be a very interesting environment to do a spacewalk in, at least uh, in low Earth orbit. you got the Earth there, and it looks kind of friendly. This you'll be out. Most of the time, you'll be pretty far from the moon, and it will be kind of dark and empty out there. No pressure. Uh, and we just signed an agreement with the United Arab Emirates to build this. So we've got another country on board, and they're ready to spend some big coin to build a big section of the gateway, and we're very happy to have them on board. Um, we have four of their astronauts working with us in Houston, by the way, uh, and uh, two of them have already flown to the space station and spent six months up there. And we love working with them, and we're very, very happy to have another international partner working with us, uh, first on Space Station and later on Gateway. I mentioned we're gonna need to be able to bring cargo up to the Gateway. So we've got a couple of space, uh, space cargo ships, one from SpaceX, one from JAXA. And it's time to talk about the near rectilinear halo orbit, which sounds very uncomfortable. Uh, but actually this is a, it, it's not even a closed orbit. If you talk to a purist about this, you, that's not an orbit. It's, it's not a closed orbit. So this, uh, at its low point over the moon's north pole, you're about 3,000 miles from the moon. At its high point, so this is the moon here, at its high point over the south pole, you're about 70,000 miles from the moon. So very high up. And we chose that orbit on purpose because we want to operate robots down in those craters in the bottom of the moon. And if we have a long dwell time over the south, we can work those rovers for four or five days, and then our orbit takes us quickly over the top and then slowly down through the bottom. And that orbit is specially designed so that as the moon tracks around the Earth, my hand is the moon, my head is the Earth, um, the moon always keeps the same face toward the Earth, so we never see the backside of the moon from the Earth. The orbit, because of its weird shape and getting so far from the moon where the Earth's gravity starts to affect it, that orbit also always stays face onto the Earth, which means it never gets to the point where the space station is passing behind the moon and we can maintain communication with it forever without having to worry about it getting blocked by the moon. 
Um, it's also one of the uh, energetically restricted orbits that Orion can get into around the moon. If you look at a picture of an Apollo spacecraft, you have the cone, and then you have a big cylinder underneath it with the engine, and that big cylinder is the gas tank. And that's why you could fly into low lunar orbit, stay there, then break out of low lunar orbit and go back home. Uh, the Orion, it has the cone, and then the gas tank is much shorter and much smaller than the cone, which just means you don't can't get as many places. We can't get down to low lunar orbit. We could not get back out of low lunar orbit if we could get there. So we're restricted to these orbits that are barely gravitationally bound to the moon, which means they get very far from the moon. So it's an orbit that uh, Orion can reach, and it's an orbit that we can do a lot of interesting stuff on the surface with. And it's an orbit that keeps us within communication all the time. And if you play your cards right, you can also make it avoid all the eclipses. So you have solar power almost 100% of the time. You know, never have to worry about the sun blocking out or the earth or moon blocking out the sun. Uh, and that says in as many words what I just told you. So about two years later, we hope to fly Artemis V. Uh, that will carry another part of the gateway up uh, and add it to gateway. It'll meet a lander. The lander will go down to the surface where it will meet our new moon buggy, which we will have launched to the moon separately without people on board. Uh, this is a picture of one of the Apollo moon buggies. Uh, people on foot can only go a couple of kilometers from a lander um, and have enough oxygen on board their suits to be able to walk back. So if we want to actually explore further than a mile from the lander, we're going to need surface transportation. Already on Apollo, they'd figured this out. And so we're getting ready to build a new lunar rover, which may look something like that. Uh, two seats, uh, seats and steering wheels for crew. Uh, but it will be very different from the Apollo rovers in that when the people go home, the rover stays and we can drive it from the earth. Or if we drive it down into a crater, we can drive it through relay for, through the gateway from earth or drive it if we have crews up on gateway that, that are not on the surface. So it will sort of function as kind of like the Mars rovers we have. Now, those rovers don't have seats or steering wheels. They have a lot of extra scientific instruments on board. Um, so when the people are there, they'll, they'll drive it around. And when people are not there, it'll be a Mars rover that we can operate remotely and do exploration even when we don't have people on the surface. I'll call it the Lunar Terrain Vehicle, LTV, because I don't know if you have ATVs here, all-terrain vehicles uh, in the United States. They're very popular. People like to go out in wilderness and drive around. And I understand these things are difficult to ensure. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a scene of what it might look like working out on the lunar surface with the with the LTV. And then we've got stuff further down the pike. You shouldn't believe any of the dates this far out because we're getting out into 2030 and so forth. Uh, around Artemis 7, we expect a large, beautiful uh, JAXA-produced pressurized rover. This one doesn't just have seats and steering wheels. It has a pressurized shell so that you can get inside and take your spacesuit off, live in there for a month and drive around the lunar surface and then do spacewalks to explore the areas that you stop in. Uh, this picture is based on a NASA prototype that we operated in Desert Rats. Susanna mentioned uh, driving rovers out in the desert. So that looks kind of like the prototype that we had out in the desert. Uh, the Jackson one, I think, is only going to have four wheels instead of you know 12. That's uh, another prototype picture. And I always look at a picture like this and say, if I can get that much window, I'm going to be the happiest astronaut on Earth. And once the engineers are done with it, the windows are going to be that big. Do you really need those windows? Yes, I really need the windows. You're going to drive off road with no windows? You know, I bet not. So we're also uh, beginning to train our astronauts for work on the lunar surface now. Uh, so, you know, we'll have them down there starting with Artemis three. Uh, during Apollo, we had some pretty crazy setups for testing our suits like this. Uh, we have a better version now called the Argos. Uh, it's a gravity offloading system. There's actually sensors and motors in there that you can dial whatever gravity you want. And it, when you move yourself, it detects that and it makes you move as if you were on the moon or Mars or whatever you like. And we're doing a lot of tests for the suit mobility, especially doing geological tasks like picking up rocks. Spacesuits are really stiff. It's hard to move in them. Uh, we're testing ladders. We're going to have to be able to get up and down from landers. Uh, we will probably have more lander suppliers than just SpaceX. So SpaceX has the elevator. We don't have to do a lander, but uh, there are other possible lander designs that will have it. Uh, more work with suits and tools. This is out in the rock yard at Johnson Space Center. So we have a, 
an area with a bunch of gravel and rocks put out there to be sort of a representative planetary surface for us to uh, test suits and tools with. You know, notice most of the tools have a nice long handle because it's really hard to bend down in a spacesuit. It's much better if you can just use a, a stick to pick things up. We're also testing suits and tools in our neutral buoyancy laboratory, the same swimming pool we used to, to practice for spacewalks for the space station. We can just hang a little bit more weight on the suit, and now you weigh one sixth of what you do on Earth rather than zero. And so these, uh, this is a prototype spacesuit on the right that we're testing in the pool. Uh, we've got a little wagon there for our geological samples. Uh, we spend a long time looking for the right sand to put in the pool so it wouldn't clog up the pool filters and would behave in water the way moon dust behaves on the moon. Still not quite right. And then we can turn off all the lights and practice working in the dark. These are some scenes from practicing in the dark in the neutral buoyancy lab. You can see the beams from the lights. That's how you know it's in water. In vacuum, you don't see any light scattered from a beam of light. We didn't tell that to the folks who made Star Wars. <laughs> we're also practicing hard for the lighting conditions we're going to have at the South Pole and sun. And even when the sun is up, it's right on the horizon. It's like driving to work with the sun in your eyes. Um, and this is a virtual reality scene that we made where we can simulate those lighting conditions. And so we can put people in the VR helmet and have them walk around a simulated landscape, see how dark it is down in those craters. Um, see how hard it is to work when you're facing directly up sun. When you're facing directly down sun, your shadow is you know, 100 meters long. And this is sort of a, a vertical scene from one of those simulations showing how challenging the lighting can be. And then we also have a rover simulator where we have two seats and a set of controls and a big bank of televisions in front of you that are showing you this rendered scene with the, with the crazy lighting. And they've done a really good job since it's still just a television. You can't make it blindingly bright. What they do is if the sun is in your field of view, they just wash out the view as if your eyes were being overstimulated by bright sunlight right in your eyes. And uh, driving under these conditions is hard. So it's not just driving to work with the sun in your eyes, but driving to work with sun in your eyes off road. Uh, there's a theme from Apollo of the rover at the edge of a crater. And this is where we're doing some of our geological training. This is in Iceland. So some of the terrain in Iceland with uh, uh, volcanic landscapes that have been shaped by floods just interestingly look a lot like um, terrain on the moon. So uh, that in a nutshell is what we're looking at for Artemis going back to the moon. And then uh, for Artemis 2, 2025 September, don't buy your tickets yet, but please watch it. And if you do, you will see this guy at the Capcom console because I will be talking to the crew on that mission as they go around the moon. My job will be to be the, the voice link between the mission control team in Houston, uh, talking on the radio with the crews. And that's all I have for talk. And I think I have about a half an hour for questions. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And uh, lots of things that I think even I didn't know, although I thought I had read up a lot about Artemis before you came. So we've got two people with roving mics here, and I'll open the floor to questions. And I see we have a lot of people who are under the age of 24. And if you have questions, raise your hand. You are more, most welcome to ask your questions too. So who starts? I'm definitely not under 24. <laughs> no. um, I've seen figures quoted between two and a half billion and four billion for an SLS Orion mission. Um, if, and it's a very big if, SpaceX managed to get the super booster and um, Starship system working, doesn't that make um, the Orion SLS uh, combination redundant? Not quite. So I'm not sure the Starship can land on Earth very well yet. Um, and Elon tends to exaggerate his readiness dates. There's even a possibility maybe that Artemis 3 will be ready to fly with an Orion and SLS and there won't be a lander and we won't get to go to the surface until later. So 
Um, we shall see, and that decision will be made far above my pay grade. But we shall see. Yeah, the, the SLS is quite expensive. Even I cannot get a figure for how much it costs. And I've asked a lot. And again, I was, I was on the design team for six years. How much does an SLS cost? <laughs> OK, gotcha. Too expensive. You need to bring the price down. Um, they're, one thing that they are working on very hard to bring, bring the price down is right now, the four engines at the bottom of the SLS, those don't get reused. And the first four Artemis flights are using the leftover main engines from the space shuttle. We had 16 engines in the barn when the program ended. And so we're going to use those and throw them away. In fact, uh, my engines from STS-122, I have one each on Artemis 2, 3, and 4. So Artemis 1 didn't have any of my engines, but I've got one each on the next, on the next three. Um, when those are gone, we have to make new space shuttle main engines, which no one has done since the 1980s but they are working hard on like 3D printing things that used to have to be made painstakingly with subtractive manufacturing. And they think they're gonna be able to bring the cost down quite a bit. And those are one of the most expensive parts of the whole, of the whole piece. So they're working on it, but it, you're right, it costs too much. They're working on it. And it's possible that SpaceX may make it all redundant, but I will believe it when I see it. <laughs> Other questions? Dave? Somebody had to ask you a toilet question. Oh, no, it's going to be a long Artemis, night. Is NASA seriously not going to let Artemis 2 go to the moon if the toilets don't work? I mean, I've been on a train with no working toilet. But, <laughs> but more seriously, Apollo didn't have toilets. So all the other things you could test, you'll sacrifice if the toilets aren't working? Yes, is that, sir. Is that correct? You may not have heard or read the debrief of the Apollo astronauts when they came back <laughs> after not having a toilet, but we have, and we don't want to fly without it. <laughs> so that's something we're going to need for, for future space exploration, and we're not going to fly without it. Um, the one we have, by the way, is so loud that you have to wear earplugs when it's on. So there's room for improvement even with the one we have. But yeah, that, that is one of the things that we are not going to, we're not going to leave low Earth orbit without it. There is a question there, Annie. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, is there anything you think that an Earth-based education just can't prepare you for living in space? No. Really? Nothing at all? Okay, we, great. When we send new astronauts to space for the first time, they do pretty well. Mm -hmm. And all that education they got was on the... Uh -oh. All that education they got was on the ground, all that preparation. Now, it does take a couple of years of basic training and then a couple more years of training specific to your mission to prepare you for that. But, you know, people do okay. Mm -hmm. We train them in the swimming pool and then send them into space to do a spacewalk, and they do okay. Of course, it's not perfect. And at the end of the day, it is only the person that's up there that can put together all these separate little bits of training to, to make the experience happen. But, yeah, we do all right. Mm -hmm. Humans are pretty adaptable. Thank you. Uh, yep. Left, there, and then there. <laughs> uh, so what would you say are some of the biggest improvements in Orion that we've kind of learned from Apollo and things like that over the years, apart from the toilet? So, <laughs> so things, that, things that have not changed since the 60s are the people and the engines. Rocket engines have basically not progressed since the Apollo era. They are pretty much the same performance, pretty much the same reliability. Things that have changed a lot are the computers uh, and also solar power. Um, Apollo is all fuel cells. Um, solar power has gotten a lot better, and the computers are unrecognizable. The Apollo guidance computer that we flew to the moon with did not have the same computing power as my laptop did not have the same computing power as my smartphone, did not have the same computing par power as my old flip phone, had this roughly the same computing power on board as your car remote key fob. Because <laughs> that has like 13 trillion different combinations so that you don't accidentally unlock or intentionally unlock somebody else's car with your key fob. 
So it's got a computer that can do all those combinations and recognize them. And that's the same computing power that the Apollo guidance computer has. So our computers are a lot better. Now, the one in the Orion is more like the flip phone because <laughs> your laptop, which is optimized for cat videos. Seriously, that's what the consumer products, they want They want to see their cat videos. They want a good resolution, a good frame rate, and they want to see the little kitten jump in the bag and fall over. And that's a lot of wasted computer power. <laughs> um, uh, those microchips are made with uh, little little features, little channels for the electrons to run around in that are not much bigger than a few atoms. And if a cosmic ray goes through there and turns a lot of ones into zeros, you get the blue screen of death and and then people die because guidance computers are kind of important. So we have to use radiation tolerant computers, which means big old chips and more like the computing power in a, in a flip phone. Um, and that's just because of the environment that we operate in. But uh, you, can, you can get to the moon in the back with an appallingly small amount of computing power. And we're gonna have vastly more than that on board the Orion. And in fact, most of Orion is gonna be automated. Um, on the space shuttle, when something broke, um, it was the crew and the flight control team that took the actions to, you know, safe that part of the system and then reactivate the backup system. On Orion, almost all of that will be automated. So the crew will only have to take action in case of a failure if several things fail and there's a combination that we haven't been able to automate. So Orion will be vastly automated. The gateway is going to be even more automated, and that is going to be one of the most important things that we do on the gateway. We need to learn how to automate the function of mission control, where I have 15 brilliant engineers who have been training for years in that front room, and each of them has three or four support engineers in the back, and they know how to operate the system, and they know how to respond in case of failures and in case of cascading failures, where this causes that, causes that, causes that, and now you've lost attitude control. You can't point at the sun. You can't point your comm antennas at anything, um, and that is why mission control is heroes. If you see the Apollo 13 movie, um, and when we're out at Mars and it takes 20 minutes for a radio signal to get back to earth and 20 minutes back. And that's not even the worst case because for six weeks around superior conjunction, when the earth and Mars are on the opposite side of the sun, you have no communication whatsoever. And we cannot pack 60 engineers worth of intelligence into four crew members at Mars. So all of those smarts will have to be built into the automation. And we are not ready to do that. But the gateway is going to be our platform for learning that nearby at the moon where if the automation doesn't work, we'll eventually get another crew up there and then the humans can take care of it. Um, or if everything goes terribly bad and there are humans up there, you can get home in a few days rather than having to wait a year for the planets to line up and then fly back to earth for six months. So that's the sort of lesson that we hope to learn at the gateway is how to automate the function of mission control when we're deep out into space and mission control cannot help. Probably more than you wanted to know, but. That's why I think Gateway is a good idea. Yes. Question with regards to the Gateway. Yes. So, how long are we going to be keeping a crew at the Gateway? So, how long will an astronaut last in the Gateway, and how many missions will they do, like coming to the Moon and back and forth, and before they go back to the Earth? So, what we expect is uh, about one month out of the year, the Gateway will have people on board. The other eleven months, it will be empty, run run by automation and run by mission control. Um, during that month, some of those crew members will go down to the lunar surface, probably two at first, but we're still talking about that. We haven't made final decision yet. Um, but they will not make multiple trips to back and forth to the gateway because our lander can barely get down to the surface and then get back and then get back to Earth to refuel. So just one lunar sortie per gateway uh, stay and about one month per year of human inhabitation of the gateway. There was another question in that area, and then we are working our way back up. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. Sure. Um, uh, I had a question about the when the Shackleton crater, if Artemis three gets there, then is there plans of like dropping a probe or something down the crater, even if like humans or blasting machines can't get there? I don't know of a specific plan to do that yet, but I'm sure we'll want to send a robot down there before we send a person, especially how, given how steep that is. Um, if you get a get a chance ever to visit Meteor Crater in the United States, it's a nice bowl shaped crater, about the same shape as Shackleton, but you know one twentieth the size. 
um, you, you drive up to the visitor center and you go out to the deck. And I looked down at that for the first time a few years ago. I only got out there recently and thought about driving down there or hiking down there. Nah, <laughs> not in a spacesuit, not with any kind of vehicle I can imagine. So yeah, I think we'll, we'll want to poke around there with robots, probably, um, some of these like tumble home rovers that are basically just a sphere and they always land right side up. Um, but they have little moving sections so they can roll around a little bit. Um, something that's going to be very robust to extremely cold temperatures, probably nuclear powered. because You can't get sunlight down there and batteries don't always do super good in the cold, do they? 40 degrees Kelvin. I'm thinking about a battery that works at 40 degrees Kelvin coming up empty. Uh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's likely that we'll send a, send a probe down there. So we have a few questions online. And so the way I do this is we have a few questions online. Then the next microphone is here. Then the gentleman back there is waiting patiently. And then you can take the microphone back to Dave. <laughs> Hannah. The system works. Uh, so the first question from online is, how did you get involved in Artemis? Did the astronauts put their names forward to be involved in the project? Or did NASA approach various people and go with their expertise? Hmm, depends on what your role is. So uh, first of all, we all, all work at NASA. Um, NASA, the agency, does not talk to us directly. We have a boss. <laughs> Our boss talks to us directly. So the crew of Artemis II was chosen by the chief of the office, <laughs> who is now the commander of Artemis II. That's a long tradition which came to an end with that. So uh, now the chief of the astronaut office is specifically a former astronaut who is not going to fly again. So they can't just assign themselves to the best mission. But that happened many, many times over the course. So uh, yeah, so that happened. Um, the Capcom job, uh, how much time we got? We got time. So uh, long ago, under a different president in the United States, they were thinking about putting crew on Artemis One insane idea, but we wanted, we had a president we wanted to please, uh, who likes, you know, big events. Um, and what, they were going to breathe out of a scuba tank. How are we going to get rid of the CO2? It was the, the Artemis one had no life support system on it. That's one of the reasons Artemis two has to be testing the life support system. First flight with crew for that life support system. We don't want to get six days away from the earth and have it fail. So, uh, at that time I, I was thinking this is, probably the stupidest idea I've ever heard, and I've heard a lot of stupid ideas, but if they do put my friends on that thing, the only thing that I can do to help bring them back safely is to be the Capcom, because I know this vehicle better than any other astronaut. I've been working on it for 20 years. I've been working on the rocket for six years. As a Capcom, I can apply that knowledge uh, from mission control and help that mission succeed. So I went to the uh, branch chief of our Capcoms and said, okay, if they put crew on Artemis One, which I really hope they don't do, can I be the Capcom? And I'd been a Capcom for shuttle and station for years and years and years. And they thought I was pretty good at it, although it's a perishable skill and I haven't done it in 13 years. So I don't think I'm any good anymore. I have a lot of work to get good again. Um, but can I, can I be the Capcom and help make that mission succeed? And they said, sure. And then they didn't put crew on Artemis 1. And then like two years later, hey, Stan, uh, we're getting ready for Artemis 2. We need a lead Capcom to help prepare the team of Capcom. We have six or seven Capcoms for the flight um, to get that flight ready to go. And this was before, just about the time we were starting Artemis 1 training simulations. I said, do you want to be lead Capcom for Artemis 2? I'm like, duh. <laughs> yes. Um, so... All right, you're it. So then I started sitting in the training simulations for Artemis One. I sat in uh, for as much of the mission as I could. Um, we've got our team named. I have a sort of a co-lead who's um, uh, an engineer who works with the astronaut office and will probably still be there after I'm gone. So he's our corporate knowledge. Uh, he and I work together great. So we bit, we trained as much as we could in Artemis One. Now we're getting started training in Artemis Two. So in that case, I said, yes, I want to do this job. And they thought I was qualified for it. Now I have to show that they were right. And that, that's on me. Um, and so I, I got the job because I asked for it. So sometimes our leadership pegs you. Sometimes our leadership pegs themselves. And then everybody kind of rolls their eyes. And sometimes you can ask for the job and get it. 
Um, but very often, depending on the day, you ask for the job and you don't get it. So just like any other work, sometimes the boss gives you what you want. And sometimes you salute and say, OK, I'll support as best I can in this other role. Long winded answer. Do you have more questions? There are, there are plenty of questions coming okay. up, which is wonderful. So it's hard to pick. So I do apologize if I don't get to yours. Um, so the, the next question I'll go with is, will it be the same crew for Artemis 2 that go up again for Artemis 3? Absolutely not? not. And if not, why? No, no, no. Once you got to go to the moon, once you do not, you need to get out of the way for somebody else. <laughs> maybe we'll see uh so yeah no uh after after artemis 4 goes to the moon or artemis 2 goes to the moon uh, those folks are going to go on to other jobs and we're going to put new people on there one of the um the policy directives we have for artemis 3 when we put humans on the moon again we are not going to have them all be white male united states test pilots so we are we have a we have policy that Artemis three or whatever the mission to put people on the moon is going to deliver the first woman and the first person of color to the moon, and so it's going to be a different world. Um, so we'll see about that. But yeah, no, you don't get to go to the moon twice. I'll give you two more. Then we go back to the room, and I might come back to you. Oh, amazing! Okay, let me just scroll there. Are there are loads coming in. Good. Uh, so it very much is a choice. Um, let's go with this one, which I very much enjoy. Do you think I'll ever have the chance to train to be an astronaut and enter space for research purposes, or perhaps commercially as a passenger for space travel? And that is from Mark Anthony, 35, from Kent in England. Oh, so the, the, the younger you are, the more that answer is yes. <laughs> Because it's still super expensive to go to space. And the main reason for the rigors of astronaut selection isn't because normal people can't do the job, really. Flying in space is not that hard. Almost any person could do it uh, in reasonable health. If you can get up a flight of stairs, you can probably fly in space. Um, but right now, there's a lot of responsibility with the hardware. And they sometimes put you in a difficult situation, such as a spacewalk. And not everybody can do that. And it takes a lot of training. Um, but in the future, the costs are going to come down. The systems will be safer and more reliable and require less interaction, less expert interaction from the crew. And space travel will become more and more accessible to everyone. Unfortunately, this always happens slower than we hope, but it is happening. You know, Watch the news, see what's happening, and you can see that gradually space is becoming more democratic and more people are gonna get a chance. Uh, just don't hold your breath and um, yeah, the younger you are, the easier that's going to be. Last one for you. Last one, at least for now, <laughs> uh, is what was the most challenging aspect of astronaut training for you? Uh, probably the same thing that's most challenging for everybody, which is spacewalking. It is very hard. The suit is incredibly difficult to operate in. Uh, it's a dangerous environment. You have to do everything right. Meanwhile, uh, in the swimming pool, your body never goes where you want it to. The suit weighs 350 pounds. Um, you don't feel that weight, but if you have to move that weight or turn that weight, it takes a lot of strength. You have to think in three dimensions all the time. It's easy to get disoriented. It's easier, easy to forget important things. And when you come out, you are, you have bruises all over your body and your hands barely close on the steering wheel of your car when you're trying to drive home. With and that, we everybody go. has to go through that. And some of us, me included, I had a really tough time with spacewalk training. At one time, they didn't think I would ever do it. Uh, but I kept trying and eventually got better. But it's still very, very difficult. And it's the thing that frightens most of our new astronauts. Interesting. Thank you. Um, so you talked about in one of the future missions about testing propellant transfer. Um, using the gateway or missions above it. You also talked about there's large reservoir of water in Shackleton. Yes. Is there an intent to move propellant from the surface to those missions in order to refuel and potentially sort of bring those back or for Mars in the future? Uh, intent is such a specific word. <laughs> Let's call it aspirational at this time, right? So the, uh, the SpaceX Super Heavy was designed to burn not 
kerosene and liquid oxygen, which most of our first stages do, but methane. Same thing with the new Vulcan rocket, methane, methane, methane. And there's a reason for that choice because you can make methane on Mars. Probably not so much of it on the moon. So there is the idea that we want our systems to be able to function on materials that we can manufacture in space, uh, but we don't have the ability to do that manufacturing quite yet. So it's an aspiration for the future. Um, right now, the gateway is being designed mostly to pump propellant between spacecraft, all of which have brought it from Earth. Um, but that's also the idea is we should be able to do that with materials that we make in space as well sometime in the future, just not soon. Thanks. You mentioned possible 30 day stints at the gateway. Is that due to um, radiation or uh, limits of radiation of humans or is it shielded? Or no, actually you could, you can fly to Mars and back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nine, six or nine months out to Mars, a year on Mars waiting for the plants to line up six or nine months back, and you will likely not get enough radiation to put you into trouble. And the limit that we have set is was made by the stroke of a pen. It's like three extra, 3% 3 extra risk of death from cancer later in life from the radiation you received. That could be 5%. You just have to change one number and get somebody to sign it. <laughs> And if you ask any astronauts, hey, uh, you're going to go to Mars, but you're going to have a 4% chance of dying later in life from cancer. Are you still up for that? <laughs> Every hand would still go up. So. Um, so 30 days in orbit around the moon with the ability to come back to Earth quickly uh, in, within a few days. And also the ability if, uh, if there is a big solar flare. First of all, we have lots of satellites looking at the sun and we have uh, we can predict when radiation is going to get bad and how, for how long. And the current plan, if you're on Orion and that happens, is you're going to build a fort out of sofa cushions <laughs> and hide in it. <laughs> so it's not quite like that, but we're going to unstow all our cargo and build a big wall and then hide behind that. And that actually reduces your radiation dose by a factor of two. So it's surprisingly effective, this sofa cushion fort. But that's our plan. So radiation is not the problem. It's how long the Orion and Plus Gateway can support people who are you know, eating and filling up the toilet, breathing oxygen and using up drinking water. It's just the amount of uh, logistics we can bring up there to support people so far from Earth. We think about one month per year is doable. If we had them up there full time, we'd need 12 times as many cargo flights. And then people start looking at the cost and going, eh, can we maybe just do one month a year? So it's, <laughs> it's economics, not radiation. Okay, I promise the next question's there, and then we work to the middle. Hi. Hello. Um, I wasn't sure if I heard you right. If uh -oh. you said that the gateway is ultimately going to replace the space station, and if it is, what's the plan for the space station? Does it get sort of taken to bits, or does Elon Musk buy it and turn it into like a hotel? Uh, Elon Musk is not going to buy the space station because no. he didn't build it. No. Um, Gateway doesn't replace the International Space Station. Um, it is just a way for the world's space agencies to continue cooperating after the station is gone. What we hope and plan to replace the space station is a bunch of commercial space stations in low Earth orbit that are uh, being paid to conduct research, that are making money flying tourists and so forth, whatever they can do to make a buck. We are hoping that we have paved the way with the space station to make low earth orbit part of the earth's economic sphere and that the power of the market will take over for us. So we're expecting uh, other folks to step forward and build space stations in low earth orbit that do what the space station does now. And that sort of frees up NASA instead of operating this behemoth in low earth orbit to do more exploring out there where private companies cannot afford to do that work. And then someday we'll hand off lunar orbit to the private sector, and hopefully they can make markets out there as well. Oh, what happens to physical space station? We're working on that right now. It weighs about 450 tons. You don't want that to come down on your head. Uh, normally when we are done with a, a space station cargo ship, um, a few of them land you know, in the ocean with parachutes and stuff like that and recover them, but a lot of them we just burn up in the atmosphere. 
Any HP Lovecraft fans in the room? There should be more of you. <laughs> okay, but now I now I know who to look out for. Um, HP Lovecraft wrote uh, um, science fiction horror in the 1920s that was full of these horrible alien creatures who had no regard for human life, and it's all kind of grim and unpleasant, but very very imaginative. Um, anyway, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's chief bad guy was called Cthulhu, who was like a 90-foot-tall winged octopus-headed humanoid that um, was preserved in some sort of deathless state in a city underneath the sea called Rolaya, which is located in the South Pacific, right where we dump all our cargo ships. So I was like, Joe, we're sending it to Cthulhu, and as you see in this audience, you know, one person in 50 goes, oh, that's excellent, and everyone's like, huh? <laughs> what do you say? So anyway, we dumped this stuff in the South Pacific. So we want to dump the station there because nobody lives within 5,000 miles of this. Uh, and that's where the Russians dumped Mir when they were done with the Mir station. So it's a good, safe place, far from shipping lanes, far from land. No one's going to get hurt. Um, but now doing the deorbit burn for a 450-ton space station, we expected we would work with the Russians on that. But we're not working well with the Russians right now. So we are quickly designing a space station deorbit vehicle, which will be a rocket engine and big fuel tanks so that we can fly that up to the space station. And then uh, when the space station is over, Europe-ish will burn that motor that will lower the space station's orbit so that half an orbit later, it dips in the atmosphere, burns up in the atmosphere. Largely, it's made out of aluminum. Aluminum doesn't survive to the ground. Little bits of steel and titanium are the only things that make it, make it through the atmosphere and land or things that are heat shielded. Uh, and it will end up in the ocean. But right now we are scrambling to build that deorbit vehicle. But we are thinking about it hard and we know we need something to do that job. And we're not sure we can rely on Russia to do it for us, which is what we had originally planned. So I saw a few hands in the middle. Julia, if you take those and then we get the microphone back to Hannah for some more online questions. And before, sorry, before you ask, I see a lot of people who are still of school age. If you have a question, you get precedence. And if you don't want to ask your own questions, ask the next grown up near you and they can ask it for you. So over to you. I'm afraid I've terrified them, but OK. <laughs> um, what would happen if there was a problem at the Lunar Gateway? Same thing as if we have a problem anywhere else in space. We have a lot of smart people who would tackle it immediately. The systems have been designed so that we have backups. If we can't, uh, we can't activate the backup or the backup is also broken, the sort of our final line of defense is you get back in your Orion and you come home early. So we, we ask that question a hundred times a day at NASA <laughs> in various meetings, trying to figure out making sure that we have a plan for everything that we can think of that can go wrong. But still, Mother Nature surprises us and things go wrong that we didn't plan on. Um, but that's it's similar to what happens on the space station. We, we try to have backup systems. We try to fix it. If all else fails, you get in your return vehicle and come home um, and hope that your return vehicle is not the thing that had the problem. Right. So over to you. Do you know who might be the person to go in um, Artemis 3? In Artemis, Artemis 3? I do not. If I did, everybody would be very, very surprised. And I would have a lot of friends all of a sudden. <laughs> hey, who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? So I have no idea. Um, that de The decision of who to assign to a space flight belongs to the chief of the astronaut office. Um, right now, that's Joe Acaba. Um, he's a great guy. He'll make a fair choice. And uh, everybody looks forward to being named. And if they're not named, they will do whatever they can to support the flight. So again, what I'm doing is I'll be the Capcom working in mission control and communicating with the crew. Other people may be um, you know, holding the hands of the wife and children or the spouse and children of the astronaut when they fly. And that's their job. Um, we have all sorts of jobs that we do when we're not flying in space, all in support of the people who are flying. Thank you for that question. And back to Hannah. Well, as I was told that questions from younger audience members yes. take precedent, okay. I picked a different question. Uh oh, it's not another potty question, is it? It is not. Okay, good. This comes from Enzo and Hunter, and it says, 
Did you ever live on a rocket? Hmm, I lived in the space shuttle. It looks like a rocket, but I was only there for two weeks. Uh, when people live in space these days, that means the International Space Station, and it does not look like a rocket. It looks like a bunch of metal cylinders hooked together and some big solar panels. So I lived for 12 days in something that looks a lot like a rocket. Uh, it was pretty small. Um, the toilet worked, though. Shuttle, <laughs> shuttle toilet worked, but the shuttle toilet is too big to put in Orion, so we need a smaller one that still works. Um, the food was okay, and the view was unbelievable. I have another one online. Okay. Uh, do you have any advice for someone who'd like to get into planetary science or astrobiology as a career? Totally go for it. <laughs> um, and and there, are, there are routes through geology, through astronomy, through biology. Um, so if any of those interest you, you can get involved in that field of study and then sort of edge toward space related. Um, for those who like space, but you know, numbers frighten them, there is space law. There is space art. We have all walks of life involved in space. Uh, so it's, it is easy to get involved if you think you're interested, even if you don't think you have the, the skill set for being an engineer or a pilot or something like that. So um, I don't use my PhD in astronomy very much. But uh, especially for the, for the academics in the room, especially the younger ones, the best career advice I ever got was from my uh, thesis advisor in graduate school um, when I was working on my PhD. And he said, you can think of the PhD in two ways. Number one, it can be a license to continue doing your thesis project for the rest of your professional life. And there are a lot of people who do that, although it's getting less common these days. The other is you can think of a PhD as certification that you can go from being an interested layman in a subject to the world's foremost expert in it in a couple of years. And that's the way I interpreted it. And that has worked super well for me. Oh, I can go from, yeah, I know what an interplanetary dust particle is, and now I'm writing cutting edge research on it. And I have had to do that many, many times in my career, and especially in the astronaut office where you're expected to master so many different kinds of things, not just knowledge, but physical skills, eye-hand coordination, crazy things like human factors engineering, um, being a Capcom where you're talking to the crew in space, it has to be concise, correct, use the proper terminology, the minimum number of syllables, understandable even over a crackly radio uh, interface over thousands of miles. And when you release your transmit button, the main message they need to have gotten was, we love you. Because as soon as the crew thinks the ground doesn't love them anymore, that bond is broken and we can no longer function as a team. So I had no reason to expect that I would enjoy or be okay at that job. And it turned out it was, but um, mastery of many different things is only going to be more important as we go to a world where people will not stay in the career, the same career for their entire lives. And any kind of academic mastery is a chance to practice that, unless you really want to do your thesis project for the rest of your life, and that's okay too. We've got another question in the middle. <clears throat> How long does it take to become an engineer for NASA? An engineer for NASA, uh, four years. Go to college, get an engineering degree. We've got job openings. It's brilliant. Yes. We have a question in there. Thank you. Seems a simple question, but why are all the space launches in September? They're not. So <laughs> September. Oh, that. September. Okay. The Artemis one, sorry. The real reason is the... Uh, government funding fiscal year begins on October 1st. <laughs> but yes, that's the real reason. Yeah, so, yeah. The odds of any of them going off in September are 1 in 12. <laughs> we have another question here. Why did you become an astronaut? Why did I become an astronaut? Because it's cool. <laughs> Although I have to understand, I, I, I understand now that I have to explain that a little bit. Um, when I told my wife that, 
and she did not think of this as an acceptable answer, by the way. Um, she thought it was because I thought that if I was an astronaut, I would be cool. She didn't know me in high school. I was like the least cool kid in my high school. I wanted to become an astronaut because I thought the job was cool. And if I get to wear a blue suit and people think I'm cool, that's okay too. But I just thought it was the most interesting thing I could think of to do. And so I applied and was lucky enough to get, to get selected. And space is totally cool. And you should learn about it as much as you can. And if you get a chance to work in it, so much the better. And there are many, 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 many different ways to work in the field of space, law, biology, geology. It all comes in. Um we got another one? Yeah, go for All it. All right, come on. I think they're going to pull me off stage in a minute, but. What do you eat in space? What do you eat in space? Uh, you ever go camping? You eat camping food, like freeze-dried stuff? Okay. Um, a lot of stuff in pouches, like uh, military folks would eat if they're out on a deployment. So, um, which usually has a consi consistency like tinned food. So dried, tinned. And then stuff that has an infinite shelf life, you get a little bit of candy and you, and you get to choose your own candy. But you also have a dietitian who's making sure you're getting all your nutrients. So <laughs> you can't live on candy. I apologize. If I... Okay. All I right. think the boss in the corner says we are done. Okay. So very big applause.